Hey everybody, welcome back. I hope you had a phenomenal holiday. Happy New Year. Um, welcome to the Innovation Storyteller Show. I'm your host, Susan Lindner, and we are talking about how to make the environments that we work in that much more energized, civilized, exciting, comfortable in a way that draws us into the places and spaces that we care about. And that's why I'm so excited that my guest, Kay Sargent, is joining me today. Kay has more than 30 years of 38 years of experience in this space and is a recognized expert on workplace design and strategy issues and is an award-winning designer herself. Kay is the global co-director of um, HOK's workplace team and sits on its board of directors. In 2020, she was named ACID's Designer of Distinction. And in 2021, she was elected from her field of peers to provide congressional subject matter expert testimony to the U.S. House of Representatives on federal real estate post-COVID-19, a view from the private sector. Kay also serves on the GSA Diversity Task Force and is an advisor for the Diversity Advisory Council. Kay, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm just thrilled to have you on. Well, I should start by thanking you because when you said 30, I actually felt younger for a few minutes. <laughs> so I, what a great way to start my morning. Thank you for that. I am not going to diminish even one year of experience. I feel like if somebody cut me open and counted the rings, like there's lots yeah, of- there are a lot of rings. There. Yeah, there's one, I, one or two I might want to erase in those mm. years. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> so, Kate, I ask all my guests when they come on, how did you get, how did you walk through the innovation door? How did it find you? I think to survive in this world, we have to constantly innovate and evolve. Anybody that's staying stagnant or staying still is probably going backwards. And I think one of the benefits that has one of the things that's really kind of fueled me and always kept me going is a sense of curiosity. Mm. And so in my 38 year career, I have morphed and there are periods where I really dove deep into certain things. There's a period where I was an expert in security and did a lot of security assessments. There's a period where we really focused on diversity inclusion or master planning, et cetera. And so I'm always curious about what's out there, and that's what has fueled me through my career. Yeah, and so that sense of curiosity, right? That's like, I feel like this is the driving force behind all great executives. If you're not curious, right, chances are problems aren't being solved in the organization either. Yeah, and if you're not willing to take some risk and put yourself out there and you're always playing it safe, then you're probably also not really advancing the cause either. That's right. So a lot of folks come on the show and we talk about looking at our innovation portfolio as almost like a mutual fund manager might, right? I might have some high risk investments. I might have some, I would say, easy, easy wins right. to get started. And then there's that stuff in the messy middle that we have to investigate and think about before we ever get to the big moonshot goals. Yeah. How do you think about um, the projects that you're working on and balance the risk versus the reward or the opportunity to hit those quarterly goals. Right. What keeps me up at night and what keeps me going in the morning. So oh, that's a good, I, great juxtaposition. <laughs> yeah. I work with 1800 professionals across our firm globally, and I am constantly getting questions or being asked things that they're hearing from their clients or seeing or being asked. And so there's that day to day immediately addressing the question. But I think what is happening far too often is people get so stuck on looking at the ground in front of them that they don't lift up their head and see what's on the horizon. And when we do that, it can kind of be overwhelming and daunting. So Susan, I'm going to throw down a gauntlet mm -hmm. and I'm going to say that in my industry right now, the corporate real estate industry, we are looking at what could be our industry's Kodak moment. Meaning, wow. we know that change is afoot. We know that things have dramatically shifted, but we just don't know how to monetize it, or we don't know how to change the way we've always done things, or we're just stuck in this rut. And there aren't enough people saying, 
we're heading towards an iceberg, pay attention to what's coming at us. And we're just defaulting on those existing behaviors. And that could be really catastrophic for our industry. And so that is what keeps me up at night. That's kind of my big, messy, how do we deal with that going forward thought that, yeah, keeps me up at night. <laughs> wow. So that balance, right, of waking people up, how do you communicate that in a way that doesn't just fill people with terror and lead them to inaction, right? Or cause them to make really knee-jerk responses to what's happening in the moment versus looking a little bit further down the road and planning sufficiently for that. Because we've all felt the shift. There's no one who hasn't felt the shift in corporate real estate going, right. well, I'm going back to the office two days a week, or I'm not even going back at all, or I've never been in the office. I think we need to take it day by day, one step in, in front of another, but we also need to think about when we're taking that one step in front of the other, what is the path that we're on? And is it taking us to the ultimately to the right destination or the wrong destination? And so you have to do both. You have to know where you're going and then you have to path, plot, plot, plot that path of how I want to get there. So you have to consider both. But I think there aren't enough people that are thinking about ultimately where do we want to get to or where is this going to take us? And we're not doing enough scenario planning. So mm -hmm. I think we could all acknowledge and admit that we know certain things, but there are other things that actually might surprise us and that we cannot predict. And so we need to be able to think about what if this happens? What if that happens? What if? And not enough people are asking that what if question and then playing that out and developing a scenario so that when it happens you're prepared so i'm going to tell you a story one of my favorite things that really resonated with me was i'm a big football fan mm. and i'm watching what's your team okay well the commanders but it's hard to be a commander fan right now but i'll, I'll say the commanders. <laughs> i was just I'm having a conversation over breakfast yeah so watching the Super Bowl one year and Willie Gulch is playing, this is a big throwback, okay? So anybody who knows who that is and can remember this, kudos to you, you get two stars. But he's in the end zone and he's just having this moment of peace and everybody is running around doing all these drills and a reporter walks over to him and says, Willie, you're about to play the most important game of your life and you're kind of hanging out, chilling over here in the corner. What are you doing? And he says, I'm imagining myself catching that perfect pass. Because if I don't imagine how I'm gonna react in that moment, that I could hesitate, I could fumble, or I could pause. And any one of those would prevent me from doing what I need to do next. And that really struck me that we should all be living our lives like that. We should all be thinking about what could potentially happen and how would we react when and if that does. And the problem is most of us don't wanna think about that because it's messy. And so we avoid at all cost thinking about those things because it can just be daunting, but we have to embrace that. Yeah, that sense of imagination is such a critical part of design, certainly the work that you do and also innovation. And I've mentioned it so many times on this podcast before, but when I asked Chris Matman, who is the head of innovation at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, how does NASA consider the future of space travel? How do you even conceive of 50 years out? He said, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. I said, try me. He said, we invite science fiction writers, screenwriters, and futurists to sit with NASA scientists and create a fiction of what the next 50 years of space travel could look like. And then we work backwards from the vision to execution. Yeah. I, I have to tell you, I'm a little terrified by that right now because there are several movies that are either out right now or are coming out about what could happen in the short term future of this country. And most of them are kind of gloomy and yeah. it's kind of terrifying. And I, I literally said to my daughter right now, or last night as we were watching the movie, I said, Hollywood tends to get it right. It just takes us about 10 to 15, maybe 20 years to catch up with it. But a lot of what they predict 
tends to come to fruition. And I don't know if it's a self-fulfilling prophecy or if what the vision is, but that is an excellent way to think about it. I will say this though. I do believe that science fiction writers tend to get the technology aspect right, but tend to fail on the social aspect. So let me Human just give an example of that, okay? So think about the Jetsons mm -hmm. and all the technology in the Jetsons. Think about Star Trek. Think about those shows and all the things that they predicted that came true. Even Dick Tracy 50 years ago with his talking. Yeah, our two-way train. They, so the technology part, they tend to get right. What they tend to fail in is that social element. So again, think about the Jetsons. Joan Jetson was still the housewife, even in the future. Or if you think about- Even the maid, right? Rosie was still a uh, female maid. Right, with a little, with the whole 1950s, like little- and an apron on thing. and a little hat. Right. <laughs> or think about in Star Trek, the women, the role that women typically played and the societal elements. That's the part that we tend to get wrong. And I think the other thing that we think science fiction tends to get wrong is they tend to think that we're going to go super high tech and everything is going to be metal and very futuristic looking. And what we know from all of the research that we do about how people respond and react is we in the firm have a saying, high tech equals high touch. Meaning the more high tech we go, the more we kind of fight back to create balance. We're always striving for balance. And so we've seen a rise in the maker movement, more authentic and organic things, more natural elements, increased biophilia, workspaces today aren't looking more high tech. They're actually looking more natural and human centric because we have to balance that out. And Hollywood, when you think about even the movie where they, they're going to Mars, et cetera, they, it all tends to be very metallic, very dark, you know, void of any human elements. That's not what we as humans crave. That's not what we relate to. And so there are pieces that I think they absolutely get right, but there are elements that we think they totally get wrong. Like even just looking at your website and some of these incredible projects, I'm thinking about the Central and Wolf campus that you um, did and kind of going through it. I learned a term that I hadn't heard before, which is biophilic design. Mm -hmm. And maybe tell us a little bit about this, these beautiful curvy wavy lines and so much glass and access to oh. um, nature from the inside, not to mention the natural portions you've put on the outside. Yeah. So I'll say it as simply as this. Nowhere in nature is there a rectangular white box with strip lighting. Right. And we as humans are organic beings and we crave things that we can relate to. And so we're putting ourselves in something that is so unnatural to us and expecting us to thrive. And so what we really have done, we have a whole practice. We even have a director of regeneration. We believe that we need to stop just addressing sustainability. Nobody wants just to sustain, right? We want to thrive. And to thrive, we need to go beyond sustaining. We need to give back. We need to regenerate. And nowhere are there better examples than in nature. You think about how animals construct their habitats or the natural ventilation systems of a, of a termite a colony or an ant colony or bees and things, how they function. It's amazing. And there's so many lessons that we can learn that we can then design structures that are emulating some of those innovations that are naturally already out there. I mean, the world is a wonder. And if we just tap into the biorhythms and the biomorphic shapes and biophilia and natural elements and embrace that, we can come up with amazing solutions, uh, buildings that have breathable skins and uh, that can flex and morph and adjust to the sun. We're, we're doing all of those things now. And it's probably some of the most exciting work that we do. And it just makes the most sense. It's logical. Mm. Do you feel like there's this, as we talk about diversity and bringing in new ideas into the conversation, do you feel like also women playing a greater role in the design, in the execution of some of these structures, that this is a byproduct of going from 
what might one might refer to as logic, reason, et cetera, right? Everything squared off and easy intersections and so forth to incorporating more or, organic, more, like you said, rounded edges in that space. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I do believe that women have different sensitivities and different traits than men. They tend to be more in being more consensus driven, right? Where men tend to be a little bit more dictatorial. They tend to be more about how they relate to things, right? Like through storytelling and through connecting. Women tend to have a greater sensitivity to the the built environment and the the sensory stimulation in those environments. But I, I think that a lot of the research that we've done around sensory processing, we as humans, either tend to be kind of hyper or hypo sensitive, men and women. And we can either need more of that sensory stimulation or in other cases, we actually need less of it. But most people find comfort, reduce stress, calming and healing in more organic natural palettes, palettes and more organic natural shapes and built environments. Men and women. It's not just simply a a gender thing there, but I do believe that there are other elements. Women tend to be a little bit more nurturing, where men tend to be more focused on, and it goes back to our primeval roots about the hunter and the gatherer and the caregivers, right? And I think to some degree, we still have some of those instincts. I'm fascinated by this, the place of this conversation when we talked about the shift and really embracing that. How do we communicate the shift that's going on in our spaces right now and how we inhabit them. A question of whether or not we go back to work when we when we engage in, in being in the office and what it means for us as contributing back to the workplace. I think we are going to look back on this and realize in, in probably 10 years, maybe some people are going to see it sooner, maybe a lot, a lot later. Uh, my prediction is we're going to look back on this and it's going to be an epic failure of leadership and communication. Mm -hmm. because we are not telling a compelling story and we are not clearly communicating, which has eroded trust. I think there are a lot of leaders that did what they thought and they said what they thought people wanted to hear, but they really had no intention of following through on that. And and then when they flipped, it totally eroded trust. I don't think that they're clearly articulating why and telling the right story. So for instance, and, and I have, uh, the other thing I think is happening right now is that people aren't sure. And so they're punting and they're defaulting versus really taking a stance and saying, here's where we are, here's what we're needing. And what, what people hate more than change is transition. People hate being in limbo. And right now, a whole lot of people have been left in limbo. And when you're in limbo, there are people that are just gonna make their own rules because you're not giving them to me. And that's, I think, what's happened for a lot of individuals. And other people are just going to feel increased anxiety because they don't really know how this is all going to play out. Mm -hmm. And so even though you may not like what Jamie Dimon or Elon Musk's message is, at least they were clear about it and everybody knew where they stand, where a whole lot of other individuals have just been kind of left hanging. And there's something really discomforting about just being left hanging. And I think what's not happening right now is if you are a leader and you believe that having people back in shared spaces is going to be beneficial for a variety of reasons, you need to tell a compelling story. You need to tell the reasons why. And in a lot of cases, it's because we might relate better as humans to each other. So for instance, me saying to you, Susan, you have so much knowledge and years of experience and so many people could benefit. The younger staff could see how you relate with difficult problems or deal with those clients. So you being in the office can really help magnify that message. And not only that, but it will help you thrive. It'll help you be more connected to things, be more in the know. And hopefully you're not just sitting at home zooming from one call to another, which we know has had a negative effect, right? We need to think about that balance scorecard. Why is it good for the business? Why is it good for the individual? Why is it good for the finances of the company? And why is it good for the environment and sustainability? 
And they need to think about what are the real reasons. And if you can't come up with a compelling enough story, then you have to question what your strategy is. And for some companies that might be, you know what? Maybe people really can work from home because they're doing head sound concentrated work or they're working in a call center. They're not really reacting to other people. And maybe that's the right course for some companies. I think the problem is that everybody is trying to find the answer. There is no longer a the answer. Different companies are going to come to different conclusions. One size misfits all. And we need to dig deep into understanding what is the right solution for you, your clients, your colleagues, and your business. So how do you think that these design concepts now in corporate spaces is going to change? Like, Can you give us a little insight on what you're already seeing now that we're three years, almost four years post-COVID? How is it shifting in the conversations you're having with clients? Well, you may not like my initial answer, so I apologize (laughs) in advance, but we've known a lot of this forever and have been working with clients that have had remote working programs for 30 years. We've had clients that have had hybrid policies for 10 years. We've been advocating for a lot of these things for a long time. It's just kind of taken this moment to add the fuel on the fire that has made people have that aha moment that, okay, we need to address this. So for a lot of our clients, they had already embraced a lot of the things that we are now strongly advocating. I mean, places should have always been a great experience. They should have always been designed around the purpose of why people are coming to the office, right? And so if if you have a hybrid policy and you're encouraging people maybe to do that heads down focus work remotely, if they can, by the way, I'm going to put a caveat on that because there, for many individuals, they have to come to the office to focus because they have more distractions at home than they might even have in the office. Mm -hmm. But we need to think about why are you coming together and then designing the spaces for that. So if you're coming to the office because you want to connect with your colleagues and connect with your clients, then we need to design spaces that empower you to do that. The old gathering spaces, the crappy conference rooms that we took the largest rectangular table we could shove into a room with the maximum number of chairs with a little screen at the end, do not cut it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about designing with authentic integrity and purpose in mind. And we, to do that, you need to understand what people are really doing and design the space around that. So what does the, uh, what is the, future boardroom look like for us? The future boardroom, I think, uh, or meeting rooms in general, I think, uh, tend to be a little bit more gracious, a little bit more spacious. I think one of the things that has permanently been altered by the pandemic is our sensitivity to the built environment, maybe how close we are to other people and how that really can be off-putting for some individuals. I don't think you'll ever... Yes, exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, how close we are. I don't think you'll ever be on an airplane again when somebody coughs or sneezes and not be like, really? Or like <laughs> acutely aware of that. The same thing is going to happen in build spaces. So being a little bit more generous. We also are much more in tune with the fact that some people need to physically move and engage and kind of to, to be able to be active. We know that there will probably always be some people that are remoting in. And so a lot in a lot of cases, we have to design spaces that are tech enabled, that truly allow for people that are coming remotely to be able to have an active role in the meeting and for the people in the room to be clearly heard and understood. In the old conference room, you had that big rectangular table, probably the most important person sat at the head of the table, the farthest away from the camera and the microphone, and they were a peanut that nobody could hear, right? So Mm -hmm. in a sense, we're flipping the rooms so that there's more equity across the table. There's more presence for everyone in the room and coming remotely. So we really need to rethink not just the the technology that we're using, but the physical layout of those spaces as well. Yeah. And so I'm assuming that there's like a lot more equity at the physical table, like it's a rounded table or a horseshoe table or something like that too, right? That we can all see one another and- It could. But here's the thing, Mm -hmm. not all meetings are the same. So there are meetings that there absolutely is a head and a board, a board room might be one, Mm -hmm. but then there are other ones that are designed around innovation, 
or counseling. And so in our research, what we found is there are actually nine different types of gatherings. And each one, depending on the duration, depending on the formality, depending on um, what the meeting actually is about, and whether it's hybrid or not, high tech, low tech, could be configured very differently to meet the need. So we need to do a better job of understanding what kind of meetings people are having and design those spaces to be more fit for purpose as well. So how do we, when you're bringing in a new design to a client or even maybe trying to push some of these structural changes or new design changes internally, Mm -hmm. what's the storytelling work that happens in, in your organization when you really want to get other people on board with a big idea, a breakthrough, a shift that maybe yeah. they haven't tried before? So we have the curse of knowledge. We do this all day long. We go to thousands of places and have seen it done successfully. And, for, and we need to understand that most of our clients, they might do this once every 10 years. For many people that we're dealing with, they've never done it before. And, and it could be a career defining moment for them. And they don't know what they don't know. They know what they've always seen every single day, but they may not necessarily know. So the very first thing that we need to do and what we broke the old way of doing it, we used to do visioning sessions. We used to go in and say, what do you want? Right. You know? And we need to realize it's like going to a doctor and saying, the doctor looking at you and saying, what do you think you have? Right. <laughs> we're the experts. We're supposed to say, here's what we're seeing. Here's what we know. Here's what's possible. And so we've changed our visioning sessions to be what we call framing the possible. And we basically walk our through clients through a series of here's what's happening. Here's how that's impacting us. Where are you now? Where do you want to be from diversity and equity uh, and inclusion to sustainability to uh, collaboration, to mentoring, to learning, all of these things that we all think we do really well, but we need to kind of key up and say, here's what's possible, here's where you could be, right? Paint that vision of the destination. Then you need to make them realize that they may not be on the path to get there, or maybe they are and they're in great shape. But before you can start a journey, you need to know where are you going and where are you starting from? then you can map the course. And we tend to skip that step, but it's an important step. And what typically comes out of that is what we're calling a gap analysis. And we'll say, okay, so here's where you think you are at a, at a two, and you wanna be at a nine. Doing the same thing you've always done is not gonna get you to a nine. You have to strategically think and do something differently. And what often happens is, well, we embark on this journey. And then as we start to design things, the clients say, yeah, but that's not the way we've always done things. Yeah, but that's not who we are. But yeah, that's not the way we do it, right? And that's holding you back behavior. And we need to go back in and reinforce. But remember, you told us you wanted to be here. So doing it the way you've always done it isn't gonna get you there. We need to do something differently to be able to achieve these goals that you have identified you want to get to. So that story of always coming back to the goals, right? Is, do you feel like you need to, is there an aha moment that winds up registering or do you look for that in order to say, this is how we get past the status quo and into future possibilities? Yeah. So what I did not put in my bio, which in all this, full disclosure, I really should put there is my real title should be gadfly, provocateur, (laughs) challenger, or pain in the ass. I am often the one that will come in and say, you have an opportunity here, right? And let's do, let's think about this. Let's do something to challenge them now. uh, And our team is well-versed in all of this stuff, but they've got to work through every single day of the client with the client. And if you've constantly got somebody that's poking you and needling you, they just become a nuance, right? And, and an annoyance. And yeah. you just don't want to deal with that. So I often get brought in to kind of remind people to kind of reset. Okay, here's where we were. Here's what's going on. Or feeding the teams the information that they need to kind of say, hey, listen, they're falling back on this or they're defaulting on this or they're saying this. Do we have anything? Do we have any examples, et cetera? So I am a collector of all kinds of amazing things from around the firm and best practices that we're seeing. So I can keep that in my little treasure chest. So when somebody says this client doesn't understand why sustainability is you know so important or regeneration or whatever do we have something 
yep, here, here's some great stuff that, that we can share. And we, as a firm, I think do an amazing job of leveraging that across our clients because most people think what they're going through is really unique. I'm willing to bet that somebody's probably already gone through it. Somebody's already done it. And if not hundreds, right? But you may not know that and you may not have access to that. So one of our jobs is to help people see there is a path here. There is a precedent. And we talk about what are we trying to achieve versus benchmarks are telling you what people did. It doesn't necessarily tell you whether they liked it or whether it worked. And it doesn't tell you whether you're anything like them. Benchmarks will get you to the stadium it will not tell you where your seat in the stadium is. Uh-huh. So our job that's a is great. Can you say that one more time? Because I think that's a really great metaphor for people yep. who go, well, I talked to Gartner. I talked to Forrester. I talked to the analyst. I talked to McKinsey, Deloitte, whomever. And these are the benchmarks they provided. So say that yeah. again. The benchmarks, benchmarks are the, the best field. way to uh-huh. get to average. Wow. No. <laughs> it will not tell you whether, and it won't tell you whether it worked for people. It won't tell you what percentage it did. Like we have clients that say, well, the, well these guys are doing this. Yeah. On 5% of their portfolio, like you know, the rest of it, et cetera. Or they're nothing like you. Like so many- Or they made clients, a billion dollar investment where you're making X million investment. Right. Yeah. So many of our clients are like, well, what does Google do? Right. Like Google isn't even Google anymore. And you're, and most of our clients aren't Google, right? So you need to understand who you are and benchmarks will get you to the stadium it would not tell you where your seat in the stadium is. So they're relevant because they tell you, am I in the zone? But to get to the sweet spot in the zone, you need to do the roll up your sleeves, deep work of understanding who are we and what do we need? And what does that tell us and how do we apply that? And I think there's been tons of failures where people have said, well, it worked for me, so it should work for you. This is where the golden rule is flawed. So again, I apologize in advance for being an equal opportunity offender, but the golden rule says do unto others as you want the want to be done upon. That assumes that everybody wants what you want, which I'm going to tell you just isn't true. Is not true. The bronze rule or the platinum rule, I think it's a platinum rule, says do unto others as they want to be done upon. Know what the people want and provide that. And we as designers, our challenge is to understand what those benchmarks and what that field of play and that zone is, but to understand specifically within that, where is your sweet spot and what's going to make this right for you? I think that for the last 40 years, we've tried to design the average space for the average person doing the average thing, but I've never had a client come to me and say they want that. And I defy anybody to tell me today, who is that average person and what is that average task? Mm. We are so diverse today, not only in our task and our behaviors, but as individuals, and we need to embrace that, which means that we need to break out of this norm of trying to design everything for the averages and defaulting to these benchmarks. And we need to start thinking about how do we create more tailored solutions that are better suited for everyone. What we've done, in the past in office space is the equivalent of giving everybody a size 10 blue unitard and saying, everybody's got to wear this because it's the average and it's the benchmark, right? This is the average size, but we know it won't fit a whole lot of individuals Mm -hmm. and they're going to suffer. We need to embrace the messiness of what designing for people really is. Not easy, right? When you're looking at organizations that have 10 to 400,000 people in them. It's not. If it was easy, we would not have a job. But here's, right. what, but here's what I would say, I think, is one of the things we embrace is options, choices, and some kind of control. I cannot design the perfect space for every single person, but I can create a space that has a variety of settings different choices, some hyper, some hypo, some enclosed, some open, some more vibrant, some calmer that will address the majority of people's needs. And then if I empower them to find the right spaces for themselves and allow them to have some adjustments, then we have a much, much higher chance of creating spaces where people will be successful. And ultimately, 
That is why we design spaces in the first place for people to be successful. And I think telling that story, right, about surpassing the status quo and that designing around mediocrity is a message that boardroom level people get, right? I don't want to design for mediocre. I, I don't design any other system in my organization to meet a benchmark to not surpass the competition, to not surpass the previous quarter's possibilities, right? All other systems in theory are designed to surpass the previous quarter's excellence. Right? Yeah, and I think look, part, part of this, and this is what, I'm gonna just go all the way back to the Kodak moment. Mm. Part of what is holding us back is the way that we design and deliver space. So in North America, we typically have the longest lease times and the most extensive build out of anywhere in the world. And, wow. and you're right, they're designing from a finished floor to the underside of a finished ceiling. Is and that because it, of the constraints around building? It, in it's it's just the way they've designed buildings, right? And, and the way that they've done things. And there's different things in different parts of the world. In, uh, in Asia and in other countries, they have much shorter lease times. They flip through space much more quickly in, in Australia, et cetera. So in the US, the mantra has always been, and nobody's ever said this out loud, but basically it is the message that has been delivered is, look, we're going to do this once every 10 or 15 years. We're going to spend a lot of money doing it. Get it right and don't screw it up. Mm -hmm. okay. And so because of that, people tend to err on the conservative side because they don't want to be really bold and take those wild steps and get it wrong and because they may not get money again for 10 years. And you have to live with it for that period of time. I mean, can you imagine if you had to buy a phone today or anything that you were expected to keep for 10 years without it being adjusted or changed, right? Like just, it's not the reality. And so what's happening is space is actually becoming an anchor if it cannot be designed to morph, evolve and change, right? Or if we are not going through more quickly. And so when you buy furniture, it's kind of ugly out before it wears out. And a lot of times- oh, I love you, that. It's gonna ugly out before it wears out. It, it will, right? And which is great for the planet, right? But isn't necessarily great for invigorating individuals. And so we need to change the way that we deliver space. We need to have more reiterations, more interims where we can reconfigure things, where we can embrace some of those changes, where we can sub out things that maybe didn't work or we somebody came out with something better two years from now and we want to be able to incorporate that into their space or how do we refresh spaces and so we are constantly now thinking about what are the opportunities to refresh this to revamp it to adjust it to morph it because one thing we know is that the elements within the space the workforce the mission of the company, the technology they're using will all change in that time frame. And is the space designed to be able to accommodate that or not? That is a whole nother challenge that we really have to embrace today. And if we aren't doing that, space becomes an anchor. So you know, I'm fascinated by the stories that we tell to get people on board with the breakthrough idea. And this shift about how we perceive a building like in some ways we crave that sense of stability and structure that comes from a place that we know and love. We know where the kitchen is. We know where the boardroom is, et cetera, but- We're creatures of habit. Consistency yeah. to be important, yeah. Right, and so in, in some way, buildings have been like this stabilizing force in the midst of so much change. It's kind of like why we love going to Paris, right? Because the Eiffel Tower and that beautiful old architecture is always going to be there and it's romantic and lovely, but it serves a different function than coming to an office that requires of itself to be a living, breathing thing and to shift with us. So it's almost like we're putting our stability desires into a place that doesn't even necessarily serve us. Is that right? Yeah, but you can have a little bit of both. Okay. Right. You can have spaces that are designed to provide consistency, continuity, a sense of belonging and a hub that you feel like this is my thing, but you could still have options and choices and they can be punctuated with those vibrant spaces that when I'm feeling super social or I'm feeling my team just won the Super Bowl and I'm going to the office the next day and I want to be around people, right? Like, where's that social hub that I can go to? Or it's, it's a holiday and so we're going to have a holiday party or we've just won this huge project and we want to go and celebrate. But then there are other 
parts that we want to retreat to. And that's part of that options, choice, and control. And a lot of this has to do with our personalities. It has to do with our task. It has to do with our sensory processing abilities. Creating that variety is what makes spaces um, not only adaptable, but human and also exciting places to be. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to think about is how do we create spaces that are commute worthy or destinations people really want to be while at the same time meeting the needs of heads down, concentrative and focused or just refresh moments, et cetera. We can do that. We can create spaces that are both. So I'm enamored with some of the ways that you presented this information because getting people to make these shifts especially when they're at home, right? And for some of us who like feel a little bit of trepidation about going back to the office and the conveniences of being able to throw in a load of laundry and then hop on a Zoom call and fold said laundry during lunch while while listening to a broadcast or a webinar or something like that in the midst of it. Um, A couple of things struck me. One of the things you said was there's a shift going on, right? We are facing our Kodak moment. The ability to communicate that, I think for all the innovators listening, is really important. When you can get other people listening to you and talking about the shift as being critical, important, and um, we are unable to turn away from this moment. I think all leaders have to be able to discern that shift and be able to communicate it. Yeah, well, here's one of the things that often happens to us. Mm. We walk into a room to have the kickoff meeting and the core team is all there and they tend to be people that are my age, maybe even older and very homogenistic. And so one of the things that we instantly try to do because we really truly embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion and we tell our clients, if if you want us to challenge you, we will. And I had an incident where somebody said, you know, yeah, we absolutely want you to challenge us on that. And I said, well, if you really want us to, we will. He goes, yeah, I want you to do it starting right now. And I said, okay, well, first question, do you even have the right people in the room? And he looked around the room and then he looked back at me and he got up and he walked out of the room and the room kind of went quiet. And I thought, okay, well, that might be my last and we right? like, Thank There, you we, so there we go, coming. we're done. <laughs> And somebody else in the room said, I'm really sure about what they want to just keep going. So we're like, okay. So we kind of kept going apprehensively. Yeah. And a few minutes later, he walked back in the room with several young, diverse staffers all around the spectrum and all different ages, all different types. And basically said, these guys are joining us on our core team. You're right. We don't have the right people in the room. Good for you. And, and it was like, all right, great. And I think one of the, one of the things we also say is, we often get a lot of resistance from the middle management. Younger people have nothing to lose because they're not invested in the system and change is great for them. The older establishment, no CEO ever left his mark by just doing the same thing and and never innovating, right? They make their mark by doing something different, making their mark, changing the course and hopefully for a positive way. And so they usually will embrace change as well. It's the middle managers that tend to be stuck in the system of this is the way we've always done it. And I'm so close now to getting what I've been striving for 30 years that you're not taking that away from me. And we have to have that moment, that, that conversation about this is your legacy. This is what you are going to be leaving the next generation. And I want you to think about your children and your grandchildren, because that's who you're designing the space. It's going to take us, we're building a new building. It could take two or three years to get that building built. If we're designing a space, it's going to, it's going to take a few months and then it's going to stand. What we're building is going to stand. And a lot of the people in this room might actually be retired in the next several years. And so we need to think about what is the legacy that you want to leave that next generation? Are you going to empower them with a space that's well-suited to them, that is going to launch them forward? Or are you saddling them with the office of 20 years ago so that in 10 or 15 years, it's really, truly outdated? What is that you're going to leave them? And it makes people then get out of their own head and realize it's not about me. Because every single client in that room, every single person, when we talk about this, they're all thinking the same thing. How does this impact me 
personally. <laughs> That's your very first instinct. Like how far is the walk to the bathroom? How far is the walk to the coffee? What's this going to do to my commute? What's it going to do? What do I want, right? It's not about you. It's about the organization as a whole. It's about the legacy that we're leaving. It's about the next generation. It's about the future that you want to build for that organization. That is the power of what we have when we're creating those spaces. And we need to help people understand that and get out of their own mindset and get out of their own way. Mm, fantastic. This has been such an enlightening conversation, Kay. I'm going to end us with the three questions that I ask all of my guests on the show. So my first question to you is, what is the greatest innovation of all time? Wow. Printing press. You're going to go with Gutenberg. Yes. Uh, I am because it, it just it enabled a whole lot of people to, to see the light, to be to be able to communicate and to see things and to be educated and to communicate. Yeah. We try to dispel the myth of the one superhero innovator on this program. And so if there's an innovation team that you could have joined over the course of human history, which team would you have liked to to uh, join? Wow. Well, it, when you say a team of innovators, it instantly brings me to the Manhattan Project, but that is not a team that I would, would like to have been on. But when you think about, I think that when we think about how do people innovate, getting everybody into together in a room together and, and helping them. But I'm going to say the people that solve the problem of Apollo 13. Yeah. Get them back to earth when everything went wrong and they had very limited things in, in the spaceship to deal with and they had to be able to figure it out. So that's what I'm going to go with the team that brought back uh, the crew from Apollo 13. Yeah, the quintessential case study of operating with constraints and mm -hmm. innovating with constraints. Yep. Amazing. Um, and lastly, what's something that totally annoys you or something you just wish for humanity that would be innovated or created that doesn't exist today? What do we really need on the planet that we just don't have right now? This sounds horrible, but I, everybody has an opinion. I've been doing this for 38 years and the number of people in the last two or three years that have popped up out of nowhere that now are experts on this are just amazing to me. And social media has allowed everybody to become an expert. But if you think there are certain expert. people, right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There are certain people that have deep understanding and then there's some that get it, but they're not experts. And then there's some that basically have surface knowledge I want an indicator on everybody's forehead. So when somebody <laughs> is saying, well, this is what's happening and it's blinking surface knowledge, but then you've got somebody at the end of the table that's like deep core knowledge. I know who I'm going to go with and like who to cut out and who to listen to. Also, it should then have another layer, which is the bullshit level, which is if you think about how many people on news that are saying things that they don't even believe in themselves, but they're professing. Uh, and just for that to be able to go off, just to look at full disclosure, let everybody know, do they really believe it or not, what they're, what's even coming out of their own mouths? That's what I want. Because I, I think the biggest danger we are living in right now is misinformation. And nobody can agree on just common facts. And it's creating such an amazing deep dive that it's frightening to me. Yeah, the huge divide. I really appreciate that. I remember a comedian once talking about how he wished every senator would have to suit up like a NASCAR driver with all of its lobbyists and sponsor decals all over them. So when they came to the Senate floor, they're like, I'm sponsored by big oil, big pharma, big insurance, big whatever. And they oh, would... I love that too. Yeah, <laughs> right. You got to wear it. You got to disclose it. Yep. That's right. Okay, Sergeant, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. How can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about your amazing design work and your sustainability work? Yeah, so easy to go to hok.com and workplace and all of the stuff that we are doing, we put out there uh, also on LinkedIn. So you can find me there. It's K-A-Y-S-A-R-G-E-N-T. And I'm not on a lot of other social media because I just think it's a time suck and I just it can't but LinkedIn I am on and that's where we post a lot of the stuff that we're doing and every now and then I'll watch these arguments and usually if I post something or respond to something it's because I'm really annoyed about something because there's so much that you could react to I could react every single day and so now it's usually I only usually respond when it's like 
I feel like somebody's way off or there's a door or it's just so one sided that they're not being really fair and telling the whole story. But that's the best way to get a hold of me. Fantastic. Okay, Sergeant, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Yeah, thanks for thanks for inviting me and thanks for making me feel younger for at least 20 seconds. <laughs> Appreciate that too. Come back anytime. We can do All that right. every time. All right. Great. <laughs> Sounds good.